question is, what, what are some hallmarks uh, of a conflict and why do we care? I've given you one example from UCLA. Uh, we care nationally because in 2002, the Sarbanes-Oxley Act uh, was designed in part to eliminate actual conflicts and even the appearance of a conflict when you deal with management performance and compensation. So all of this is out of the Exxon uh, problems and uh, the Enron problems and anything else starting with an E. Uh, and the notion is uh, the federal regulations want to produce untainted results. People should be working for a specific purpose and not for uh, other purposes that could conflict with their prime objective. Uh, attorneys worry both about actuality and the appearance of uh, problems, uh, and so this law talks about both actual conflicts and things that look like a conflict, things that when they appear on the front page of your newspaper, you would be embarrassed. What ethical principles apply? There are a number of them. This slide lists just some, uh, but the notion of honesty and truth-telling is important. You don't want hidden conflicts. Why was the Halberton uh, contract a no-bid contract? Were they, in fact, the only company that could possibly rebuild bridges uh, in Iraq? Uh, objectivity in science. If you are doing research on a non-FDA approved drug or device, the FDA wants to know that what you're doing is as objective as possible. It's not biased by the fact that you happen to own the startup company or that you have the patent or that you can personally profit in some way uh, from the research. Now, it's impossible to be totally objective. You're always going to profit, even if the only profit is writing an article, which may be the seminal article that will entitle you to get promoted, there is still some personal reason that uh, you're doing this, but to the extent possible, uh, science is supposed to be objective. Uh, there's the ethical principle of beneficence. You want to protect uh, patients. You don't want bad science with bad results getting into the stream so that other doctors prescribe drugs that it turns out are not uh, efficacious. You want to avoid divided loyalties. You want to know that uh, the individual is not a servant of two masters, but in fact is working towards one uh, goal. Scientific integrity, openness, independence. Uh, why do these principles matter? Because these are the basis for how laws get written. Those of you who do IRB work know that the Belmont Report came out with three basic principles beneficence, autonomy, and distributive justice that were used as ethical principles upon which to build regulatory uh, rules. Benjamin Cardozo uh, once said that laws are not written unless they are first broken. Right? First there's a problem, law as a reaction uh, to past abuses. So you have to figure out what the ethical principles are and how they are going to be used to construct rules. Here's a generic definition from a New England Journal of Medicine article. A conflict is a set of conditions in which professional judgment, professional judgment concerning a primary interest tends to be unduly influenced by a secondary interest, where primary interests are determined by your professional duties. So if your professional duty is an employee of this university, and mainly what you're doing is trying to get a job for your brother-in-law, uh, then you have a secondary interest that's conflicting with your uh, primary interest. How do facts influence this? Here's the NIH's definition. I did not make this up. This is the National Institute of Health definition. The primary obligation of employees is to obtain knowledge to promote health. A secondary interest could include supporting a family, earning income. These secondary interests in and of themselves are not unethical, uh, but they have the potential to compromise the judgment of clinical researchers. April of last year, that's a little extreme. right? Your primary interest is to obtain knowledge. It's sort of okay to support your family and earn income, but you know, you gotta be careful about that stuff. Why, why is the definition that tight? Because of past abuses, because if you're working for the NIH, and one of your jobs is to regulate 
companies and it turns out you're getting $200,000 a year from those companies, it looks a little squirrely. Right? So they write this very restrictive definition. Here's a more balanced definition. A conflict occurs when an employee is in a relationship with an outside organization. An employee is in a relationship with an outside organization where the employee can influence the employer's business in a way that results in benefit to the employee or detriment to the employer. The servant of two masters problem. You're an employee. You should be working for the benefit of your university, but in fact, you're working for some other goal. Conflicts are not bad. Conflicts are an inescapable part of life. Uh, I had a choice of being here today or being uh, at an executive officers meeting at the University of Michigan uh, this afternoon. I had a conflict. I resolved the conflict by coming here. Right? Conflicts aren't bad. Conflicts are an inescapable part of life. But what you have to do is figure out where the conflict is and whether it can be managed. So I manage my conflict by saying to the executive officers, do you need me next Monday? And they said, next Monday? How about any Monday? No, they didn't say that. They said, no, we can dispense with your services for next Monday. Uh, that'll be okay. Uh, and so I identified the fact that I had a conflict. I was going somewhere else to do some other work uh, rather than doing work for them. And they said that was fine. I had identified it. I could manage uh, the conflict. Now, sometimes you look at the law of unintended consequences. So the Bayh-Dole Act, an act that was passed in 1980, said institutions can take federal grant money and if they figure something out that is worth patenting, they can patent it and they can keep the money. Private corporations don't do that. If you do a contract with uh, Big Pharma, uh, they'll say you can do the research, but we get to keep the patent. Federal government says it the other way around. We'll give you money. If you figure out something worth keeping, keep it. Get rich. It's okay with us because science is getting disseminated. Well, that's fine. But the unintended consequence is it increases the potential for conflicts. Because now individuals can get NIH funding and do their primary job, research, teaching, education, patient care, but can also get a patent and make personal money. So it increases possibility of uh, conflicts. Are universities responding to this problem? You bet. You are working on a policy. Lots of other institutions are working on a policy. Uh, there's a site at the end of this article that uh, David has, an article that was written in January of this year uh, by a group of people from Harvard talking about their policy and some issues that you have to consider. Uh, the Harvard policy is probably one of the uh, tightest policies. It says you work for Harvard, you work for Harvard. <laughs> you don't do any of this outside. Uh, stuff. So all universities are looking at this uh, problem. Here's a case. Uh, ICU, who's an ophthalmologist at Hey U, is studying an ointment for dry eyes uh, while owning a majority of shares in the company that holds the patent to and would market the medication once FDA approval is obtained. Any conflict? What's the conflict? PI and holds the patent. Right? Clear conflict. Can it be managed? Somebody give me some ideas for how you would manage this conflict. What are we worried about? Worried about bias? Full disclosure. Huh? Full disclosure. Full disclosure. So you say to the patients, or you say to the potential subjects, by the way, I think this ointment is so good that I bought the company. Is that the kind of disclosure you want? It may not be a neutral full disclosure. It may, in fact, say to the potential subject, I was a little wavering about whether I wanted to be a subject in this research, but now that I know you think it's that good, I'd be delighted to be a subject. Not the result that you want. Full disclosure is a possibility. What else? You might have to... Yeah, you might actually have to manage this by saying he can't be the PI that somebody else needs to be the PI because there's got to be separation in order to avoid intentional or unintentional bias in the research. 
Now, I've been talking about conflicts as if they were financial, but of course, there are lots of different kind of conflicts. Conflict could be financial. You own stock in a company, and you're doing research for that company. That's a financial interest. Uh, could be non-financial. Nepotism problems that we've always had uh, to deal with. Physician versus researcher uh, problems. Uh, I tell the uh, doctors at the University of Michigan, uh, you have to make a clear separation between those roles. You know, you have to say to the patient, as your physician, I am sorry to tell you that your cancer has reoccurred and there is no more established therapy that I, as your doctor, can recommend. I'm going to leave now because there's nothing more I can offer you as a physician. In a moment, my evil twin will come in. We're identical, so my evil twin will look very much like me, uh, but you'll notice a difference because my evil twin will be wearing a hat that says researcher rather than a hat that says doctor. And my evil twin will tell you that he has an NIH-approved research project for your disease. But remember, I do therapy, my evil twin does research, and there is no guarantee that the research has any therapeutic benefit at all. I know you're desperate because you've just had terrible news that your cancer has reoccurred, but listen to my evil twin as objectively as possible because while I have a fiduciary interest in your health, he does not. Now, I can't get the faculty at the university to actually wear the evil twin hat, uh, but think about it. It is a division of responsibility in the same person, right? Different goals, different objectives. And of course, the patient never gets it. The patient hears, I got bad news and I got good news. The bad news is your cancer has reoccurred. The good news is I have the magic bullet. It's a research protocol, but it in fact will save your life. In fact, God knows what they hear if they hear the word cancer, but if they hear anything at all, they hear hope. Uh, you know, I sort of describe it. Well, a, a doctor asked me once, well, big shot, how, how would you describe research. And I said, okay, you say to the patient, listen, you have just fallen off the boat. We're in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. And I'm looking down, and there you are in the water, and I notice there's a rope next to me. And I say to you, listen, you want me to throw the rope? I don't know if it'll reach all the way down there, and it looks like it's got some grease on the end. What do you say? What's the patient going to say? Oh, no, don't bother. It's okay. <laughs> right? No matter how you describe it, what they're going to say is, yeah, throw it. What the hell? Might help, can't hurt. Well, is the can't hurt part true? What happened last week in Britain to six healthy, normal subjects who signed up for research because they were going to make some money? They got nearly dead as a result of uh, a research study. So, the, sure, throw the rope, can't hurt, might help is not exactly the right uh, approach. So there are these commitment problems. When you're a mentor for a student, is it your job to make sure the student gets a PhD or to make the student write as many papers as possible that you can put your name on? Right, or maybe say to the student, what are you getting a PhD for? Go work for my startup company. Be much better for you. Conflicts of commitment. There are also institutional conflicts. And the hardest thing I predict you will have to do in writing your policy is to figure out what happens when the institution itself has a conflict because the institution owns stock in the startup company uh, and the institution is the one doing the studies. We'll come back to that notion. So here's a full-time faculty member, Dr. Greedy. He's got an idea for a new device. His university patents the idea. Greedy wants to do the animal testing. Are we okay? Probably okay. There's lots of regulations about animal testing. Animals don't really get to consent. Uh, and uh, you can be pretty objective, although you still worry about bias sneaking in here. Animal tests go well. Greedy says, I have unique knowledge and skill. I want to be the PI on the human subjects research. Typically, the answer to this is you can't be the PI. Greedy then says, but I have unique knowledge and skill. I think the answer to that is, if you have such unique knowledge and skill that you are the only person in the universe who can make this work, it's never going to be commercially viable anyway, right? So what are you messing around for? There's got to be somebody else, somewhere else, who can do this 
uh, research. So we had a doctor at our hospital, a uh, uh, cardiovascular surgeon, who invented a new ring for mitral valve uh, replacement. Uh, and he was trying to convince the Conflict of Interest Committee uh, that he should do the research. And we said, no, you can't do the research because you hold the patent to this. The institution also has a 40% interest in the patent. We have to have the research done somewhere else. And he said, no, but I'm, I'm the only surgeon that can do this. And you know, we said, what, you got 12 fingers? What, what's it? what do you mean you're the only surgeon who could do it? What do you want to bother patenting this for if you're the only surgeon in the world who could do it? And he said, oh, well, after it gets patented, any cardiothoracic surgeon could use it, but I'm the only one who could do the research. And we said, no. Nah doesn't fly. You have to uh, let the research be done uh, somewhere else. And he continued arguing for about a half an hour. And I finally couldn't stand it anymore. And I said, what are you, the Lord of the Rings? <laughs> Didn't go over nearly as well as it just did. But, it, <laughs> uh, but I mean, that's the conflict. And, and people, the, the point is, he wasn't worried about conflict. He was, this is his baby. He invented it. He wanted to get it out of the nest and make it fly and all that uh, good stuff. And, and he, he wasn't thinking about big picture. He had these blinders on and we had to kind of work him through uh, the process. You can have real conflicts where money is actually occurring uh, or other kind of benefits. You can have potential conflicts, no present benefit, but there's possible future uh, benefit. And you can have, as I mentioned before, the appearance uh, of conflict. Uh, so here's a case that we had. A physician from Pfizer, uh, which has a big office in Ann Arbor, uh, said, uh, I'm a pediatrician. I'm working for Pfizer now, developing new drugs. But I want to keep my clinical skills up, so I would be willing, and Pfizer would, would allow me, to run a half-day clinic for you. You don't have to pay me anything. You can keep all the billings. I don't want anything. Conflict? Seems pretty altruistic, right? Physician wants to come, run a clinic, we could set up a clinic, this is all to the good. Uh, the Conflict of Interest Committee looked at it and said, well, wait a minute, Wh what kind of drugs are you going to be prescribing? Uh, and the answer was, whatever the patient needs, I'm a doctor. And we said, well, you know what, you can come and run your clinic a half day a week, uh, but we have to have somebody look at your prescribing practices to make sure that you're not steering people to Pfizer drugs. Uh, and that's what we did, and we set up that kind of oversight. Uh, and it's actually worked out very nicely. She's been able to keep her clinical skills up. It doesn't look like she's steering people. And after two years, she said to us, this is terrific. It's good for me. It's good for you. It's a real win-win. Now, I have unique education, talent, and experience, so I would be pleased to serve on your pharmacy and therapeutics committee. And we said, no, thank you. That's an obvious conflict of interest. You have a primary allegiance to Pfizer. It would be a conflict of interest for you to serve on our committee, and there's no way we could manage that conflict. You can keep running your clinic, but you can't be on the P&T committee. You see how the continuum uh, goes. There are conflicts uh, that are also regulatory. So Michigan has a state law that says if you're an employee of the university, the only contract you can have with the university is your own employment contract. So that uh, the university has a school of music and they have a jazz trio. The Department of Surgery wants to hire the jazz trio to play at their Christmas benefit. That's a conflict of interest under Michigan law because the trio are employees of the university. They're playing at a university function. They're not entitled to bill because that would be a double billing. Okay? So you have to worry about state law conflicts as well as real or potential conflicts. So how do you think about this? If it's personal financial gain, you think about conflict of interest. If there's institutional gain, you think about institutional conflict. If it's a dispute between roles, uh, then you think about commitment, conflict of commitment uh, sort of issues. How do you identify a conflict? As I understand it, what you do here is people send in reports. Here's what I'm doing on the outside. 
I'm on the Data Safety Monitoring Board, I'm on the Speakers Bureau, I'm doing this work for this company, I'm giving lectures over here, I have this startup company in my garage, uh, I have this much stock in these uh, different kind of uh, companies. How about audits? Do audits? Probably not. Very few institutions do. Sometimes you audit research grants, but you don't audit individuals. You certainly don't ask for their tax returns to say, uh, Dr. Dukas, last year you said you didn't make any money on the outside. Let me see your tax return to see if that's true. Oh, look, $10,000 on the outside. That seems to be a problem in reporting. So there's a big hole here. It may be that what you are doing is getting reports from the people who are good corporate citizens and not from the jaywalkers. They simply may be under-reporting, and there's a real interesting question, especially with you know, minor stuff like academic freedom, uh, in trying to figure out how you get that information. But it's one of the problems that you'll have to deal with as you write these uh, policies. How to identify a conflict is a big deal. How to manage it is even worse. Uh, I was telling uh, David at breakfast, one of the first things that the university did was say, well, here's how we're going to do conflict of interest. Everybody's going to file a piece of paper, and then we'll be done. And I said, good. So where are all those pieces of paper going to go? Well, you know, I'm around. Uh, who's going to look at them? Who's going to scan them to see if there's a conflict and to figure out how to manage them? And the executive vice president for medical affairs said, well, what do you mean? And I said, well, let's try it. Let's pick, we pick 40 people, have them fill out their reports, and send them to you. And a couple of weeks later, on his desk, were 40 reports. And I sat down with him, and I said, so, what are you going to do with these 40 reports? And he said, I don't know. I said, well, what do you want them for? It's the illusion of management without the reality of management. You actually have to look at these reports. You have to see what these people are doing, and you have to see if there are conflicts, and then you have to figure out how to manage them. It was at that point that we created our Conflicts of Interest Committee so that they would get the reports. Because he certainly didn't. Because what are we talking about at a medical center like uh, yours or mine? How many thousands of reports were going to land on his desk? that he could read in his spare time and manage. So we have a conflict of interest committee whose charge it is uh, to look at all that and try to make sense of it and try to manage it. You can manage conflicts by monitoring, uh, by disqualifying people, uh, by requiring divestiture of financial interests, like the Halberton uh, example, uh, blind trust, severing uh, relationships. You can create fairly sophisticated management plans. Now, some management plans uh, have financial and commitment problems. What if you're the head of a department and a member of your department also has a startup company? And you own 20% of that startup company. Can you do the performance evaluation for the person in your department or does somebody else have to do it? Right? So you have to start thinking about all these tricky issues with both financial and non-financial issues. Uh, so you set up typically conflict of interest committees. They are independent, they are objective, uh, they determine if conflicts exist, and they create management plans. So who are the members? This is a classic university problem. We want them to be independent and objective, so we'll, we'll appoint them from within our own uh, group. right? So we have the fox guarding the chicken coop. Uh, maybe we will do what the IRB institutional review boards do, and we'll have a community member who can say, not so fast. What do you mean that's a good conflict plan? Doesn't look like a good conflict plan to me. But that's a lot of burden to put on a community member. So we're still sort of feeling our way into how you do these. Uh, but there is that internal problem that you have to worry about. What's the committee have to do? It's got to protect the institution, it's got to follow rules, it's got to create policies, it's got to protect researchers from misplaced charges, right? Things go both ways. Um, it's not an easy committee to set up, it's not an easy committee to work with. The key kind of roles are to uh, identify conflicts, create plans uh, that manage and monitor, uh, liaison with the Institutional Review Board so that you can do what was suggested earlier in terms of disclosure to potential uh, research subjects uh, and make sure uh, that you've got ongoing 
uh, evaluation. So you come back to these plans on at least a quarterly uh, basis. Can these committees always work? So here's Tidy U. It's got a conflict of interest committee. It's composed of several faculty members, including a couple from the Department of Surgery. Uh, the head of surgery is an advisor to a venture capital fund. Gets some money for doing that. And if the fund do, does well, he gets a bonus at the end of the year. A member of the surgery department has a patent on a device. Royalties are shared with the university, so there's institutional and personal conflict. Uh, and there's uh, a startup company. The faculty member holds an interest in the startup. The chair of surgery does not. The startup needs funding. The head of surgery says, oh, not a problem. I'll introduce you uh, to the venture capital company that I advise, uh, and perhaps they will fund you. Can the C of I committee actually manage this problem when some of the members are from the Department of Surgery? Well, first, they'll all have to recuse themselves because they have a conflict. There may not be enough members left to manage this. It may be high enough up because it is the chair of surgery uh, that the committee feels uncomfortable trying to create rules to manage the head of an important uh, department. And this may end up getting kicked to the dean of the medical school or the vice president for research uh, or something like that. So it's not clear that conflicts of interest committees can always manage uh, all these kinds. They can certainly identify the conflict. They can certainly suggest ways to manage it. Uh, but there may be political uh, problems when you try to set up these uh, committees. You have to think about the IRB's role. Conflict of Interest Committee says, IRB, you ought to do this. IRB says, hey, don't, don't be telling us what to do. We're independent. It says so in 45 CFR 46. You can't tell us what to do. We'll do what we think is in the interest of the uh, potential subject. We'll determine whether an individual can be on the research protocol and in what capacity. We'll decide if we're going to require disclosures of interest uh, or not. In fact, we'll decide if somebody without any interest in the research protocol is the person who will be going through the consent process. Declaration of Helsinki talks about uh, to avoid uh, power imbalance. Physicians can't consent their patients. It's got to be somebody who doesn't have that power relationship. So here's Dr. Fib, uh, V. Fib, a cardiologist. New drug company gives her $5,000 a quarter to visit the company and consult about potential new drugs. New Drug also pays her to head a data safety monitoring board. Uh, when she lectures about her work, New Drug pays her expenses and provides an honorarium. She always discloses her relationship to New Drug. She now submits a protocol to her IRB concerning research with a non-FDA approved New Drug company drug. The research will be funded by New Drug. Can she be the PI in the study? Well, look at all these conflicts. She gets $5,000 a quarter. She heads a data safety monitoring board that will be looking at adverse events from her research. She gets paid to lecture about her work. There's too many conflicts here to manage. Either she has to give up her $5,000 a quarter, resign from the data safety monitoring board, and give up her lecturing, or she can't be the PI on the research. That's the kind of evaluation that a conflict of interest committee is going to have to do. To make life even more interesting, there are a series of federal rules on conflict. They were written for research, uh, but you have to be aware of them. So Public Health Service, National Science Foundation, NIH, FDA, all have their own rules. And because it's a federal government, the rules are all different. Right? Because even though they're under one umbrella, they never talk to each other, and they make up their own rules. Uh, and they each have a different theory behind them that you have to understand to see how the rules work. So the Public Health Service and NSF have one set of rules. Uh, they've been in effect since 1995. Their theory is to avoid conflicts that could influence the outcome. This is the promoting objectivity in research principle. It's a condition of the grant, so you have to disclose as a condition of the grant any conflicts. If you've got more than $10,000 in 
the company, or if the company is paying you more than $10,000, or you have more than 5% of the stock in the company, you have to disclose to the funding institution uh, your conflict. $10,000, pretty low number. If there's a conflict, the institution must manage it, either by public disclosure, independent monitoring, disqualifying you, forcing you to divest your financial interest, or severing the relationship. In other words, you can't be uh, the PI. So Dr. Fibb, because she got 5000 a quarter, is over the $10,000 rule. She's disqualified if her grant was coming from the federal government instead of uh, the drug company. NIH created guidelines in 1994 post Scripps. What happened at Scripps was a major drug company said to Scripps, we would like to buy your intellectual capital. We'll give you a lot of money, and in return, you'll do work for us. It'll be terrific. You won't have to write grants anymore, uh, but we'll own all your intellectual capital. The federal government freaked out. And they said, in order to preserve institutional freedom, and in order to allow for the timely dissemination of research, because we're, we're afraid if, if, the, if the drug company owns you, and the results are negative, they'll get buried. They'll never get out in the press anywhere. Uh, so if you have any agreement over $5 million a year or $50 million total, or if any company wants to own 20% or more of your total research funding, then, or the funding is longer than five years, then the institution undergoes heightened scrutiny by the NIH. They don't define what that is, but it sounds bad. And, and nobody wants it, you know? Nobody wants an NIH inspector sitting in your institution scrutinizing you. So institutions tend not to enter into these kind of uh, relationships. The NIH, as I mentioned before, also has internal guidelines governing how their employees can interact with outside companies. They are very strict. Uh, and in fact, Elias Zerhuni is trying to get them a little more liberalized because what's happening is some of the uh, who he considered to be his best employees simply left and went to industry uh, because they couldn't get the external funding that they'd been accustomed to getting in the past. Uh, the FDA was a little late in the game. Their regs weren't effective until 1999. Uh, and the theory behind their, reg their regs is if we're going to approve something, a drug or a device, a biologic, we want to make sure the data is good. We want to make sure the data is reliable. So the sponsor not the individual, but the sponsor has to report conflicts, and the FDA has to review the reports. Now, because these regs were written later, their tip point is $25,000, not $10,000. Uh, some kind of equity interest. They don't, sell, they don't have the 5% uh, rule. Uh, they say an equity interest worth over $50,000. Which sounds okay until you start thinking, you know, startup companies, equity interest in stock, it's penny stock until the research is done. And then that penny stock might be worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. So at the time that you disclose, you say, I own 20% of the stock in this company. It's worth nothing. But if this research works out, could be a big deal. But at the moment, it doesn't hit your tip point. So there's this interesting problem when you move to a dollar instead of a uh, percentage. The sponsor has to report, not the individual, under the FDA rules. There are also a bunch of other rules. For example, the anti-kickback laws that prohibit any payment in return for a referral. Uh, so here's Dr. Sleepy. He's a neurologist. He's asked by Western Minds to do an independent medical exam on several of the Western Mine employees to see if there's any relationship between mining chemicals and workers' reports of medical problems. Something that some of you may have been asked to do in the past. Rheumatologists get asked to do this all the time. Neurologists get asked to uh, do it. He finds no relationship, and he's willing to testify as an expert witness in their workers' compensation case. Any problems? Not so far. Barry decides to write up his findings. He applies to his IRB and requests a waiver of consent because he has seen 50 people, but he hasn't seen them as subjects. But now he writes 
uh, to write this article. So should the IRB allow the waiver? Should Barry disclose to the IRB his relationship to the company? The company's not paying for the study, but it did pay him to be an expert witness. I'm going to throw this in just so you can see how complex some of these issues could be. I think there may be a conflict in here, but it's a little difficult to find it under the strict definitions of conflicts. Here's Dr. Fentanyl. Uh, she wants to study a vaccine produced by uh, GIS, Genetics is Us, uh, and it's used to treat follicular lymphoma. Her husband is general counsel for GIS. The study is going to recruit 200 subjects, give 100 the vaccine and 100 standard medication, biopsy the tumor, and do a two-year follow-up. Conflicts? Absolutely. Her husband is general counsel for the company that is funding the research. Therefore, there may be intentional or unintentional bias. So the question is whether Sue has a conflict, and I think the answer is yes. Then the question is, can it be managed? So you start thinking, well, can she recruit subjects? Can she give the vaccine? Can she read the biopsy? What if it's blinded? Can she be involved in the study at all? When could bias creep in? And you have to do this evaluation. So let me just see a show of hands. Do you think, how many people think she can recruit subjects? You think she can recruit subjects. Why isn't that a conflict? Because just the simple recruiting, Just straight recruiting. If they meet inclusion and exclusion, she can die, she can recruit. If they meet inclusion and exclusion, and if the inclusion and exclusion is fair, and if, and if, because she could bias the study by only including people. So you have, but right, but with, with enough ifs, maybe she could uh, recruit. How about administering the vaccine? How many people think she can do that? Purely administrative, can't influence the study. Probably she can do that, but probably she doesn't need to do that. Can she do the biopsies? No, well, you know, they're blinded, but on the other hand, bias could creep in, so we're worried about appearance of reality as well as reality itself. Probably she shouldn't be doing uh, the biopsies. Can she be on the study at all? She probably could, but it may be more discreet to simply say, you know what, so you've got other things uh, that you can work on. What if she has unique knowledge? This is a unique knowledge problem again. And it may be that you can make an argument about unique knowledge that would allow her to be on in some monitored uh, sort of way. So what does this mean? What do institutions have to do? It's simple. All you have to do is comply with federal law, protect the reputation of the institution, foster innovation and technology transfer, create new knowledge and patent it whenever possible, and encourage arrangements with commercial entities, like a piece of cake. No, no conflicts between any of those particular problems. Uh, has anybody actually gotten into trouble? Well, the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center did a graft versus host disease study. They started it in 1983. Uh, and both the researchers and the Hutch owned some of the stock in the company. Stock wasn't worth very much, but as the study started to produce positive results, the value of the stock started to go up. Ultimately, there were charges, both civil and criminal, against the Hutch uh, that resulted in May of, 19, of 2004 in a not guilty finding. I mean, they actually went to court. Some of the patients, or some of the subjects, I should say, who were in the study, sued them and lost. Now, did they lose because everything was kosher, or did they lose because uh, the Hutch has a good reputation uh, in Seattle? Difficult to know the answer to that question. I'm a little cynical, so I think there is something having to do with suing Disneyland. Uh, but this was one example. University of Pennsylvania uh, enrolled Jesse Gelsinger in a genetic therapy case. University was well on its way to being the preeminent university in the United States to do genetic therapy, right? That's what Bill Kelly wanted to do. Uh, and uh, he did. And Jesse died. The research that was being done uh, was research where the PI had a significant share of the company. The company funded a significant amount of the research, and the university had some interest uh, in the company. Now, just 
so you understand that I'm not being smug about this. Uh, Bill Kelly was chair of internal medicine at the University of Michigan. The researcher involved in this was at the University of Michigan. And but for the grace of God, this slide would say the University of Michigan, not the University of Pennsylvania. Because this research was actually started at the University of Michigan, uh, and the animal studies were done at the University of Michigan. And it's just luck of the draw that Bill got the job at Penn uh, and moved the research to Penn, right? Otherwise, that would have been us. And, and I don't think there is any way that before the fact we would have been able to identify uh, and deal with this problem. Maybe we would today, because today people have to file their conflict of interest reports and we would see the, sh the stock ownership, but back then there were no such reports. So it's just a cautionary uh, lesson. As a result, not only is Penn not the leader in genetic therapy, uh, but they are under an order from the federal government not to say the word genetics for the next three years, right? Uh, and the PI's career was essentially ruined. A very smart guy. University of Oklahoma uh, in the year 2000 stopped a melanoma vaccine study described by its PI as, quote, the cure. This is how we used to consent subjects. You want to die or you want the cure? Tough choice. Uh, after the Office for Human Research Protection audit found an egregious lack of control, uh, including poor manufacturing, over-enrollment of subjects, lack of ongoing oversight, poor consent, conflict of commitment. This is not a conflict of interest. Nobody was going to make any money on this deal. This was a doctor who said, I have the cure. You may not have seen doctors like this, uh, but they exist in other places. Uh, and they're a little over exuberant in saying to patients, you could die or I could cure you, which one do you want? Right? Conflicts of commitment problems, not just financial conflicts. Here's Dr. Squirrel at What's the Matter You. Uh, he's got a grant from drug. Anybody old enough to get this reference? Yes, yes okay. Rocky and Bullwinkle. Uh, and has determined seven new uses for an FDA approved drug company drug. Seven new uses. While the FDA approval is pending, Squirrel, as part of the Speaker's Bureau, lectures about the new uses with full disclosure. Is this a conflict of interest? It may not actually be a conflict of interest, but it is a violation of the FDA rules against promoting a drug for non-approved uses. So what's the point of this slide? You have to worry not just about conflict of interest, but about compliance with other federal regulations. Uh, and so the Conflict of Interest Committee can't have blinders on. It's got to worry about anti-kickback. It's got to worry about lots of other issues as well. Can I make it into a conflict of interest problem? Sure. What if Squirrel owns stock in the drug company? Now it's a conflict of interest. What if he urges students to work for the drug company instead of finishing their PhD? Now it's a conflict of commitment. What if he says, I want nothing for myself but drug home Co. should make a charitable contribution to my university to fund my research. Still a conflict of interest. It's just a more subtle conflict of interest. So here's a case. Um, ZYDE Co. or Zyde Co. Uh, offers a $25 million unrestricted multi-year gift to needy you. It also suggests several collaborative drug sub studies. Uh, newly minted, a PhD, wants to study neuronal activity in goldfish, uh, but is told by her chair to study biochemical aspects of one of Zydeco's drugs. Conflict of interest? Conflict of interest, conflicts of commitment, because you've got a new PhD who is being steered in a direction that she may not want to go. What about academic freedom? Well, assistant professors don't have any, so that's easy, right? No, not, not quite. I mean, there's lots of interesting problems here, and you can see this all the time. These are not made up examples. The names may be made up, but the examples are not. Here's a drug company that tells, I'm a private practitioner uh, in solo geriatric practice, not employed by your university. She's out there just doing practice, that they'll pay her 100 bucks for each patient she sends to Ivory Tower U uh, for possible enrollment in a lipid-lowering drug study. She has to send a medical history with each patient, which is why they justify giving her a hundred bucks. Is this a conflict of interest? It certainly could be, because her 
primary interest is in taking the best care of the patient as she can. Now she has a secondary interest in steering them somewhere else, HIPAA privacy problems, other uh, problems. Who's going to regulate this one? Nobody. Not going to fall under your uh, committee. There aren't any private committees that regulate this. And increasingly, if drug companies feel uh, that you are uh, being too fierce on conflicts of interest, this is where things will go, just like research is increasingly going to third world countries uh, because of IRB uh, controls. Here's Dr. Good, who's got a $50,000 a year consulting arrangement with Gendrug. He doesn't do any Gendrug studies. He just has this consulting arrangement. Gendrug has a leading arthritis drug, uh, and Dr. Good is asked to do research on upstart drug companies' proposed new arthritis drug. Conflict? You bet. Getting $50,000 from the competitor. How good is this research going to be? Dr. Good, of course, is pure as the driven snow. Not a problem. And you say, appearance of a problem, just as good as actuality of a problem. We don't believe this can be managed unless, Dr. Good, you would like to give up your $50,000 a year consulting arrangement. In which case, sure. You could do this research, as long as you don't have stock in Gen Drug. Here's Dr. Box, done 20 years of basic science research on the pancreas at Way Out U. He's got a theory for an artificial pancreas. And his tech transfer office patents is the idea, and Way Out allows him to set up an outside startup company where he owns 60% and the university owns 40%. He wants to allow some students to work at the company. He's their faculty advisor. Can he do that? Students have a right to choose, don't they? Pretty clear conflict of commitment, though, so you've got to have some oversight to see whether the students are doing that because they want to or because they're being forced to. He wants to subcontract some of his work to his university. University says, oh, good, money for us. But they also have to worry about the conflict because they stand to benefit institutional conflict as well as the individual. He wants to be the PI on the protocol. We've already answered this question earlier. Nope, can't be the PI in the protocol because of uh, bias. So there's lots of problems in this uh, perfect, uh, imperfect world. So what do you do? How do you analyze the conflict? You look at relationship with the outside organization. You look to see if there's interference with the employer's business. Interference could be even more money, but it's still interference. You look at whether, where the financial gain goes. You follow the money, right? Does it go to the staff? Does it go to the employer? And if so, does it do so in a way that interferes with the employer's prime objective? Or is there some detriment to a prime objective of the employer? Are students being delayed in getting their PhDs? Uh, is research being steered in, in an inappropriate way? If there's no financial gain, are there other improper advantages? Conflict of commitment advantages. If a conflict exists, can it be managed? Can you either cure it, manage it, or eliminate it in some way? That's the analysis that you have to do every time. So here's Eek and Meek. Some scientists claim that the desire to be a lawyer can be traced to a virus. Really? How's it transmitted? He doesn't know. The government cut off his funding. <laughs> there are a series, uh, and uh, David has uh, the slides, and so I won't go through in the interest of time uh, the current thinking. Uh, but the point is, Office of Human Research Protection, NIH, Institute of Medicine, American Academy of Medical Colleges, uh, JAMA, the uh, journals, uh, the Government Accounting Office, uh, various uh, federal senators are all thinking about how to manage conflicts. Now, when the federal government thinks about how to manage conflicts, the next thing you get is more federal government regulation about how to manage conflicts, which we will get unless we do a good enough, we, academia, do a good enough job so that we can convince the federal government that there is no need for regulation here. But look at this. There's an article by Davidoff, Navigating the Uncharted Territory of Industry-Sponsored Research, NIH Draft Guidance on Protecting Research Subjects, the British House of Commons report on the influence of the pharmaceutical industries, not just us, 
This is nation, this is worldwide kind of uh, issues. Here's Dr. Zahuni, NIH director. Uh, here's the article that I mentioned uh, earlier, Troy and Brennan's article about health industry practices that create conflicts of interest. So there are a series, and this is just a short list. I got a big list <laughs> on, on conflicts uh, of interest. So these are just some of the things that you have to start thinking about when you do your uh, work. So here's the conclusion, right? Maybe the monks and nuns who took vows of poverty were onto something, right? No conflicts. Uh, if that doesn't work, what you need is a well thought out policy, a strong committee with community uh, involvement uh, that will look good on the front page uh, of your newspaper. So let me stop at that point and see if people have questions. Thank you so much. So questions, and Ed, you could just abbreviate the questions. If yeah, I know. Some yeah. Questions? Sure. Yeah, Paul. Paul, Paul go ahead. I observe that it is uh, bothersome is that uh, some research who, researchers who are aware of the issue of conflict of interest nonetheless speak openly of their, of their contacts and support that they're getting, but this risk is effectively having on the data. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, what do you do about people who talk about things that are conflicts, but who say, but I'm above it all, this is not a conflict. If you look at the Brennan article, one of the things they cite are some social science literature that show uh, when you get trinkets from drug companies, you feel a sense of obligation, even if it's only a pen or a, or a small trinket. And as much as you say, oh, look, it's just a pen, it's just a coffee cup, it's just a flash drive, it's just a vacation to the Bahamas, it doesn't influence me uh, in any way. In fact, it does and it creates some sense of entitlement. And I think what you have to say is, we are worried about the actuality and the appearance of conflict. And we know that anything that you receive that is other than you know, a grant that we can monitor has at least the appearance, if not the actuality, of problems. And so we have to understand it, has to be disclosed, and we have to manage it. Sure. Could you discuss the hypothetical situation of an uh, institution being in conflict of interest as a strategy? Good old you um, uh, has a strategy to become the best research university you know, in the land. And let's say that the leaders, the presidents, of the deans get a cut of the research grants. Right. Is that a, a conflict of interest? Okay, so the question is, You've got a university, good old you, uh, and it says, we've noticed that we're slipping in the, in the polls, in the U.S. News and World Report polls, and our goal, our mission is to be the best university in the United States, the best funded university, the best external grant funded university. And in order to sort of encourage all of you to be in line with that goal, uh, there'll be a bonus at the end of the year uh, and it'll be a percentage of the increase in grants. So the question is, have you, by uh, incentivizing people in that way, set up a conflict of interest? And if so, uh, is it a conflict of interest that can be managed? This is a big debate now. I mean, this is a big debate among doctors, a pay-for-performance uh, approach. Uh, arguably, that's okay as long as you recognize what you're doing you recognize the potential for conflict because what you're saying to your faculty members are oh, that patient care stuff and that teaching stuff, you know, forget about that stuff, go get grants. Uh, and not only will you get the grants and do the research and write the papers, but you'll also get a cut. Uh, that could be a conflict. It could also be a violation of some other rules because the question is where are you getting the money to do the bonuses? If the money's coming from the grants, you're probably violating federal grant rules uh, by putting the money back in that way instead of doing strict accounting. You know, if somebody gives you $100,000 to do the research, you're supposed to spend $100,000 for the research. Universities have been getting into trouble. Uh, University of Washington just paid several million dollars in federal fines 
because it had the habit of taking research funding that was not expended for a research project and flipping it into another project. And the federal government said, that, that's a violation of our cost accounting rules. You can't do that. So you have to worry about where the money would be coming from. But yeah, it's a conflict. It can be managed. But you have to worry about all these different layers of management. David. Here at the University of Glenogo, we've been discussing means of which to deal with the pharmaceutical industry and what's locally called the product manufacturer representatives. Yeah. And I know that the University of Michigan, yeah. the University of Pennsylvania, has come up with a means by which to deal with that. How to work with drug reps, their detailed sampling, their mails, the ghost writing, the CME speakers, yeah. uh, that sort of thing. And that policy was developed. Um, and that there was some after effects in terms of how, you know, what happened when that went into place. And yeah. what I'm interested in is, if you share for the rest of the audience, what did happen? How, how did it get developed? What was the after effect when it first went into effect? And right. now, a couple of years out, what has happened? So the question is, if, if you develop a policy, uh, as we did at the University of Michigan, and it cuts back on uh, pre-existing rules, free samples, free food, uh, support for uh, conferences, other financial uh, support, free access by the drug uh, detail people to the house officers and the attendings. Uh, if you change the rules, uh, how do you change them and what's the uh, fallout? We change the rules by saying, uh, actually we, we consulted with Nancy Reagan, uh, and we got the famous Nancy Reagan poster, her response to uh, drug problems, just say no. Just say no. So we said, we're just saying no. No more drug samples. No more free lunches. No more unfettered access of drug detail people. The only people that the drug detail folks can go see are the people in the pharmacy uh, department, uh, but they can't go see the individual doctors. Uh, and the house officers anymore, uh, and uh, grants for uh, educational activities have to go to our uh, postgraduate medical education department, and then they will decide what to do with the money. So if Pfizer wants to give us $10,000, uh, we might use that for uh, a geriatrics conference, uh, even though Pfizer may not have any geriatrics uh, drugs. So you put this bunker in between. So what happened? Well, initially, there was a lot of pushback. There was pushback from the companies who say, look, we're doing you guys a favor. The only way you can get your house officers to noon conference is if we supply the food. And we said, you know what, we'll figure out a way to get our house officers to noon conference, like by telling them they have to be there, or maybe by feeding them ourselves, a novel concept. Uh, and the drug companies said, well, we're not going to give you any more money for postgraduate education. So there. So I actually called up the vice president of Pfizer and said, did you know that a couple of people came to Towsley and said that they weren't going to give us any more money? And he said, they did? I'll take care of that. And a day later, we got a letter saying, just kidding. We'll give you more money, and we'll do it however you want. We don't care. Because they think they'll still have influence, and they may be right. Uh, but. Uh, the short term, and there were a lot of people running around like Chicken Little. The world is coming to an end. We won't have noon conferences. We won't have this. We won't have that. We won't. And two years later, the university is still there. Life goes on. Uh, we have adjusted to the new reality. Uh, there were a couple of months where security had to go running around the hospital and remove some drug reps. Uh, but that's kind of toned down. Now, what I don't know is to what extent everything has gone underground. Uh, for all I know, there are some lovely drug reps uh, taking various doctors at my institution and their families out for dinner. I don't know. I can't. It's hard to police. Uh, it could be happening. I'm not saying that it is. I don't know that it is. Uh, there are certainly an uptake in uh, these kind of, well, we have a new research uh, grant that we want to give you, 
uh, but we want to tell you how to manage it appropriately. And the only way we can possibly do that is to take you down to Charleston, South Carolina, uh, because then you'll be away from your phones and your computer, and we have you to ourselves, and we can make sure that you are going to do the research in an appropriate way. So we're seeing a little bit more of that. You know, the, you, have to go, you have to be isolated so that we can teach you how to fill the forms out properly. And did they also stop the drug samples and the drug choice? Yes. The, the drug samples uh, are all gone. Uh, actually, the biggest fallout of that was the individual physicians and uh, faculty and staff like me who knew where the samples were and who knew how to get access to them. Uh, and we all said, oh, nuts, now we're going to have to pay for our own meds. <laughs> and we're still here, and <laughs> it's okay. Uh, and uh, people tend to have pens that say University of Michigan on them now, instead of, you know, various drug uh, company names. Uh, now, so what has happened? The industry has adapted. Uh, I told David I was at the uh, American Academy of Neurology annual conference a couple of weeks ago in San Diego. Uh, and I went down to the exhibit hall, uh, and uh, every booth was giving away significant stuff, not just little tchotchkes. They were giving away flash drives, but they weren't giving them away. Because I walked up uh, and said, oh, can I have a flash drive at Boston Scientific? And Boston Scientific, no, no, we're not allowed to give you a flash drive, doctor, uh, but if you fill out this survey, which will only take 10 seconds, then in exchange for your valuable time, we would be glad to compensate you with this flash drive. And I said, well, two things. One, I'm not a doctor. I'm a lawyer. Uh, and they said, that's okay. You can still take our survey. And two, uh, do you need my social security number? And they said, why? And I said, well, for the W-2 form. They said, what W-2 form? I said, well, if you're compensating me for my services, this is what we lawyers call income. And they said, oh, no, we don't do that. <laughs> so, you know, the drug companies are not foolish. Uh, and, and, and by the way, this is not anti-drug company. They are in business. It is a good business. They are in business to make money for their shareholders. That's fine. I believe in free market. Uh, but you just have to watch how the system adapts as you put rules into place. If you put a rule in that says no more toys at the university, there will be no more toys at the university. There will be toys, but they'll get them somewhere else. They'll get them at their annual conferences. They'll get them at their national meetings, but they won't come onto your premises. Other questions? Sure. As the federal administration decides to put more budget Department of Defense or something rather than research. Yeah. And we become more dependent. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Big Pharma has a code that, that tries to put some regulations into place. You are going to have your own conflict of interest rules. But the, but the question is absolutely the right question. The question is if the prime source of research funding, the federal government, starts giving out less money, how are we going to run our engine? Where are we going to get the gasoline? And the answer is going to be from industry. I said earlier, under the federal government rules, Bayh-Dole Act says, you invent it, you keep it. Private industry is going to say, you invent it, we keep it. Uh, and so you're going to have to rethink that environment. And you're also going to have to think about audits and compliance so that your researchers know that somebody is looking over their shoulder to make sure that the drug companies aren't overstepping the boundaries. It's just going to be a more complex and matrixed environment. Uh, again, nothing wrong with industry money as long as you understand the strings that come with it and you manage those appropriately. Other questions? Sure, Paul. Is there an auditor that is not a member of the board or an institution in the way typically appointed so as to look over the shoulders of those who are doing the monitoring about how 
Yeah, so the question is where do you find this independent auditor or monitor that I've been talking about? Uh, and the answer is uh, we're going to have to create them. Now, the accounting companies are going to be willing to do that for you. They will develop the expertise and come in and do an independent audit. You may have at your institution internal audit who can develop some capacity. Uh, what we're looking at at the University of Michigan is the possibility of creating our own office for internal research audit that is under the vice president for research. The problem is that in and of itself is a conflict because the job of the vice president of research is to bring research money in. So the vice president of research doesn't want to be interfering with that money uh, flow. I think in a few years more and more universities are going to have a vice president for compliance independent of the vice president for research to avoid that conflict. But I think that's the direction uh, that we're moving. Last questions. Okay, thanks for your time. <laughs>